Um, so I'm picking up where we left off in the section towards the critical hermeneutics. I'm going to move pretty quickly through the first uh, section where he unpacks his question, uh, which is how can there be critique within hermeneutics, and then move rapidly to his critical supplementation uh, to hermeneutics of tradition, where he tries to explain how he thinks there may be built into hermeneutics already a potential for a critical uh, moment. Um, so, so the idea is critique in this sense and critical, uh, he, he relates critical in both the senses we've been talking about, both critical in the, in, in the Kantian sense, the sense of modern epistemology, and critical in the sense of critical theory and the critique of ideology. Um, and, and that's because there's a way in which uh, what, what I was just talking about in terms of sexism or uh, heterosexism or racism or all these sorts of um, uh, uh, all these sorts of identifications of systemic distortions, uh, the idea uh, that, that he wants to have, like I said, is, it, is, it, is, is what you're raising as the correction to the distortion is, is not simply a competing narrative and viewpoint, but somehow true. Uh, and so the critique of ideology, when it's, when it's unveiling um, systemic distortions, it's not simply then positing an alternative tradition, it's somehow um, uh, unveiling uh, some truth of the matter, something that's not merely contingent. Uh, from a hermeneutical perspective, that's unthinkable. There's no place to go for that. So, um, as, as I said, Gadamer does his best to escape the contingencies of, of all our communities and our, our own selves, given uh, times and places, with his uh, classical example or the recognition of authority. Um, so, uh, for instance, when I go to my oncologist, uh, then I know there's a certification procedure. There's, there's all sorts of reasons why this person is qualified as an expert, uh, and this is not um, a blind obedience. This is a, a recognition of authority, which can be duly mapped in terms of success of people in uh, treating a disease and, and how that success is then um, you know, iterized through a, a science and, and through a, uh, testing of, of people who are qualified to think and understand uh, how these things work in those terms. But, but also with regard to, say, um, ethical truths uh, or uh, judgments of, of taste uh, within the arts, uh, there you, 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 it's more difficult to think about, well, what, is, what are the standards that you would get? I mean, with, with oncology, the standard's pretty clear. You, you do this and the patient lives, or, and you do this so the patient dies, and it's pretty clear whether one thing is working or another. Uh, it's, it's not as clear how to set up standards uh, in areas of, of the arts uh, and the humanities and in ethics. But there, he says, we, can, we do have something which actually does transcend any given uh, time and place, and, and that's where he talks about, Gadamer talks about the classical example. Um, these, these ideas in wisdom traditions, these classics in art, and literature, and music, and poetry, uh, where there are no objective standards by which we adjudicate, right, and, and compare a Bach and a Beethoven, let alone a, um, a Bach and a, um, um, a Michelangelo uh, painting, where you're in, in the arts, but, but really changing uh, modalities. Um, but we, we, over time, as certain pieces uh, uh, are, are, are show through their uh, usefulness over time, that they speak in multiple contexts, there Gadamer thinks we get something that transcends um, those limits w without escaping the flux of history. So the classical examples are those things which somehow transcend their time and place, but they don't transcend all time and places. It's just where you get maximal inner subjective agreement. Uh, and, and that, he says, is a basis for reasonable uh, discrimination um, in, in the arts and humanities and um, in areas where you're dealing with uh, taste, not in the sciences. Now, again, I, I, um, as Ricor says, there's a recognition of a critical inst instance of vague desire constantly reiterated but constantly aborted within hermeneutics. I, I think that that doesn't quite capture it, I, I, um, although there is a sense in which as you read Truth and Method, you feel like Gadamer is 
trying to name things as true with this classical example, um, and, and we, it appeals to for, uh, law, for instance, common law and how that works, the classical there, and various religious um, insights of, or insights of the wisdom traditions. Those, he, he, it, you do get a sense that he wants to proclaim these to be true in a way that transcends the contingencies of history, but he, he just can't. So the classical is, is the best he can do to get something uh, now that there's no you know super transcendent now that you you can't appeal uh, uh, to authority or tradition uh, now you can't escape history because of the character of our thrownness within being uh, so that's the sense in which the ontology trumps the epistemology so that there's no return route from ontology to epistemology which is again here what Ricoeur wants and will claim to get uh, and we'll look at the, the claim he makes we're uh, Gadamer, then, uh, I don't think it's abortive uh, insofar as, as he he does the best he can as a classical example, but I do you do get a sense of a vague desire for more as you read uh, Truth and Method. Um, and uh, so so that's that's what, um, though, um, that's what Ricoeur clearly wants. He clearly wants that uh, critical moment. And so he, he's going to say, is there some way within hermeneutics that we can talk about this critique? And, and that's where he's going to go to um, this work on um, distanciation as a legitimate form of alienation, not simply an ontological fall uh, from grace, uh, he says, um, but uh, um, a, 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 a productive distanciation which gives us distance from a text and allows us to escape the immediacy um, of our of our of our contingent understanding of the moment. Uh, now, uh, now this is where um, again I'm going to end up disagreeing with this. I think that's already built in uh, to Gadamer's fusion of horizons uh, when he says there's no horizon that has us absolutely, uh, even if we can't have a view of the whole. He says there's also no horizon that we can expand, we can encounter other horizons. Uh, that's where uh, uh, Gadamer's uh, already doing this. But Ricor is doing it here because he wants to make a move further uh, than Gadamer. And, um, and so what he wants to do is uh, say, uh, and it's interesting, he makes appeal to history. The emphasis always come back to exegesis or philosophy. Um, and, and hermeneutics has always kind of come out of this uh, mediation of texts. And it was the Schleiermacher, it's the New Testament, uh, and, and Plato, he's a translator of those two. Um, and Diltai uh, locates it, the task vis-a-vis uh, -vis and finds something of a critical moment where he's looking for the critical, as we saw, in the um, phenomenon of the uh, fixation in writing of the experiences of life, those air Um So... So what he does then is he says, what we're going to do is we're going to revert to the problematic of, of the text, and we're going to work from there to make our uh, universal uh, claims. And and so he wants to say um, that that with the text, there is a threefold autonomy that the text uh, obtains, as we see, um, the uh, um, through hermeneutics. I mean, this is something, this is old news to us now, but let me make it clear. There's the intention of the author, which the text transcends. So the meaningfulness of the text is not determined by the attention of the author. Again, when doing all of this, it's it's to, just to simplify everything. It's it's good to think, it, it, you know, just at least imagine thinking in terms of a journal that you wrote 10 years ago. So when you read that journal now, um, you're no one's in a better position to know what you meant 10 years ago than you. Uh, and, 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 but even then, the, the purpose of reading the journal now is not simply to think what you thought then. Uh, the, the meaningfulness of the text is the meaningfulness it has for you now, knowing what you thought then. Um, and, and this is the context in which uh, Gadamer talked about a fusion of horizons, where there's an imaginative uh, uh, encounter with a, another distant horizon, now your own horizon of you in the past, uh, you're encountering through this writing, and then your current uh, horizon, and it's in that meeting of the two horizons, as you are from your current horizon, re imaginatively uh, placing yourself again through that writing in that place in the past and encountering yourself there. There, there's a fusion of horizons which, uh, is, which, is, which is productive. It doesn't limit you to what you think now. It doesn't simply replicate what things meant in the past. It's the meaningfulness of the text now for who you are now in light of your encounter with who you were 
then. So even there, the, the original intention of the author, um, it was you then, it doesn't dictate to you the meaningfulness of the text now, although remembering that initial, what you meant originally by it, uh, is helpful because it creates enough distance, it's a productive distance, uh, from what you were to what you are, so that the text can challenge you. And, and in that sense, in some ways, the more distant the text, the more um, challenging and productive it can be. Uh, but 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 that's that is uh, Gadamer in his talk of fusion of horizons. Uh, what Record is going to do here is is create is is in a sense replace that point of fusion with the text itself. So now the text is going to get its own autonomy. And as we read in these next paragraphs, this text starts doing things, and and that reification of the text and giving it the ability to do things, I think that's all very misleading uh, language because the text is not doing anything. It's really, literally, the reader, uh, who is the one who's engaging the text, who's doing everything, in, including imagining that other engagement, imagining that the distance of the other horizon, which creates the fusion of horizons. Uh, but he wants to make that, make that text give it substance, because that's what's going to give him the critical moment. That's going to give him something that's that somehow is outside of, of, of history in our reading and dictating to us. So, so the, uh, the, the text escapes the intention of the author, it also escapes the original cultural situation. So whatever the situation you were in when you wrote the diary, uh, the meaningfulness of the text for you now is not limited to what it meant in that context then, right? So so then you were married and now you were widowed. Uh, then you were, you know, I mean, just add it in. It, 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 where you are now makes a difference in what the text means now. So, so the meaningfulness of the text escapes the original attention of the author. It also escapes the um, original cultural situation. And, and it also escapes the understanding of the original addressee. With the, with the journal, it was you, yourself, as you're writing. You're reading it. You're the original addressee. What that meant to you then, once again, does not dictate what it means to you now. So in that threefold sense, um, what the text signifies um, escapes the original intention of the author, the um, uh, uh, um, uh, original uh, um, audience, the original context of the author, yeah, and the original audience um, of the author, the original readers, and 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 he says this is where the text then uh, becomes a work. So so that's the distanciation um, where the text uh, uh, gains this autonomy. And, 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 and through this um, uh, becomes a work. That's why he has this little brief paragraph. The emancipation of the text constitutes the most fundamental condition for the recognition of a critical instance uh, at the heart of interpretation. For the distanciation now belongs to the mediation itself. Uh, and above that, let me read the places here. The, in short, the work decontextualizes itself. Notice how this text now starts to do things from the sociological as well as the psychological point of view and is able to recontextualize itself differently in the act of reading. I mean, that's literally incorrect. The text is not doing these things. The reader is. But he needs this text to be doing this because that's the heart of the distance, the critical instance, that's going to give him that, that sort of objectivity, that critical instance, which is not determined um, by the reader. So he uses he uses the contrast then between um, writing in, in contrast to work, and work is going to get him that objectivity he wants, the work, the, what the writing is. Um, so, in, and here he says, uh, discourse as work takes hold in structures calling for a description and an explanation that uh, mediates understanding. Uh, so, for it is the task of understanding to bring the discourse what is initially given as structure. I mean, this is really a return to Dilty, right? So, the expressions of life fixed in language. Um, and, and then you're going to read that language and, and get back to what those expressions of life uh, signify. Um, and, and, and Ricoeur wants to stress this is not something you can do naively. Um, it's the task of understanding to bring the discourse, what is initially given to structure, right? So, so the discourse becomes a structure, and then the structure gives you back your discourse, which is your, your uh, current understanding. 
Uh, but to do this, he says, it is necessary to have gone as far as possible along the route of objectification. Um, and, and this is how you get to the matter of the text. And this is really now we have, not only do we have a text doing things, but we have the matter of the text, uh, which he says is uh, the matter of the text is not what a naive reading of the text reveals, but what the formal arrangement of the text mediates. Uh, if that is so, then truth and method do not constitute a disjunction. Uh, okay, this is a reference, of course, to the title of God and His Truth, uh, a book, Truth and Method, where he sees in the method uh, of the sciences an alienating distanciation, which alienates us from truth in the historical sense, the, the sense of being, right? So for Gadamer, the, that's the relationship of um, um, truth and method uh, as an ontological fall from grace, as an alienating distanciation. Now again, he doesn't just end there. He, he gets that fusion of horizons and he has a distant and near, he has an other. So uh, the, the key move Ricoeur is trying to make here comes with this, um, in a sense, reification of the text. Now the text has a structure which gives it a matter or the matter. Note the singular here. Um, uh, um, so, so that um, uh, um, in the, under letter C, which gets us to the uh, world in front of the text, uh, the, it seems to me the properly hermeneutical moment arises when the interrogation transgressing the closure of the text is carried towards what Gadamer himself calls the matter of the text, namely the sort of world opened up by it. Uh, the sense of the work is its internal organization, whereas the reference is the mode, the mode of being unfolded in, in front of the text. Uh, so so uh, these should all be in the plural. Uh, and, and moreover, which texts are we talking about? That'll be something to keep in mind. It's not an accident up above, I don't think, that he's mentioned Plato um, and the New Testament, right? He's, he's putting us, uh, you know, when you read all of this with those two texts in the background, uh, even from this person who's the master of, uh, you know, of bringing in, Habermas for hermeneutics of suspicion, that, that tends to open you up in a friendly way to the text. Uh, but what if you're reading Mein Kampf uh, or some other uh, um, nationalistic or sexist or um, racist, racist text? Uh, then the matter of the text, and the independence of the text, and the fact that the text um, uh, has a it, it's become a discourse with a work with a, with that has to be worked out. You know, okay, well, all that's true. That doesn't necessarily mean I want to open myself up to the world that text opens up, uh, right? So th this entire discussion at this point kind of goes off the rails if you stop thinking about the text that he seems to have in mind. Um, so the power of the text, again, see how he's giving this text power. Um, so what is thought is no longer intention hidden behind the text, but a world unfurled, unfolded in front of it. Um, the power of the text to open a dimension of reality implies in principle a recourse against any given reality and thereby the possibility of a critique of the real. Now again, the sort of text you have in mind when you read that makes a difference in how uh, significant you, you find this move uh, to be. So he thinks by freeing, the, he, he starts by freeing the text from its original context, author, and audience. And then as it, as it moves, it has a, it has a form uh, a structure which dictates the sort of world that opens up in front of it. And, and because you don't just read yourself into the text, but you have to do the work to, to figure out that text's world dictated by that structure, he wants to say, that gives you a world which is a, is, is a distance away from your own world. Um, and that uh, uh, raises the possibility of a critique of, of the real. Um, and he says it's, it's in poetic discourse that the subversive power is most alive. But again, this only works if you're thinking about reading texts which you would want to affirm as open in a world that you would want to have a poetic challenge to the real um, in the name of, um, of, of a critique of systemic distortions. Uh, in other words, I, I, I don't think that, that um, this objective moment he's trying to get through the text um, I, I, it, there's no there's no criteria for discerning him on text unless he ends up appealing back to Gadamer and the classical example. Uh, then I don't know how he has any way to adjudicate among texts. So this 
critical moment. This is where I'm, I'm not convinced by his move uh, to a critical moment. Um, so, um, yeah, hermeneutics of the power to be thus turns. I'm in the middle of the, uh, right before uh, the section with the small letter D. A hermeneutics of the power to be thus turns itself towards a critique of ideology uh, of which it constitutes the most fundamental possibility. Distanciation, at the same time, emerges at the heart of reference. Poetic discourse distances itself from everyday reality, uh, aiming towards being as power to be. Which, again, if you read that in the context of, of, of Mein Kampf or a nationalist or white supremacist text or something like that, it is just, it's not going to sound as innocent and as happy an appeal to something objective which can uh, disrupt uh, systemic distortions in the name of a critique of ideology. Uh, so I don't see how he's getting his critical moment. Uh, it, 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 he, he's begging the question of, of what's good, what makes a distortion, a systemic distortion, a distortion of what should be. It, not simply one way to look at it over and against other ways to look at it. Um, all right. Authentic, unself understanding is something which is Heidegger and God, which they can be instructed by, again, the matter of the text. To understand is not to project oneself into the text, but to expose oneself to it, to receive a self enlarged by the appropriation of the proposed worlds which interpretation unfolds. In some, and again, it depends on what text you're imagining for how you reacted to this sentence, but he has nowhere specified the sorts of texts we should be imagining. He's, it, 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 this work has been done surreptitiously with the reference to Plato and the New Testament, although nowadays that reference to the New Testament, uh, because we're so aware of, of, it, of the way it carries systemic distortions that can be harmful, I'm not slamming the New Testament here. I, I, I think it's a, uh, that would be a text uh, to go to, but not to go to simply in innocence, simply to open oneself to, and, and there's no uh, a priori reason for him to be privileging the New Testament and Plato and the other good texts he's thinking about, uh, that um, over and against text uh, that we want to say perpetuate a systemic distortion. Um, in some it is, is the matter of the text which gives the reader uh, his, so again, these male pronouns are ironic here, dimension of subjectivity, understanding is thus no longer a constitution of which the subject possesses the key. Well, whoever said the subject possessed the key, the point is simply in the end, the subject is ineluctably um, a part of determining the meaningfulness of the text in their reading of the text, right? So once the text can't do these things, which it can't do, it, it is the reader who does all this in the end. Um, it is the reader who imagines, uh, the, the, from using the text, is able to creatively imagine the distance. So there is a, a poetic opening there. Um, it is the reader who's met in the, in the fusion of the horizons. It's, it's not the text itself. Um, and the text does not, um, uh, not only does it not necessarily dictate the matter of the text, because the text could mean different things different peoples in different times, but there's no reason to think the text is a good text, one that's going to do the sort of critique of ideology, uh, which is is the intent of everyone who does the critique of ideology. In other words, this is the whole, also in Habermas's thought, um, it, when I said in the last lecture, it's that contingency, uh, which is an issue for both of them. Uh, it's, it's not objectivity, it's, it's the fact that in this, um, uh, these interpretations of the character for understanding, th there's no space to name um, a moral realism. It, it, it becomes competing views um, all the way uh, through. That's what he's looking to escape, but he can't do it here uh, by putting that on, on, on the text. Uh, reading introduces me to imaginative variations of the ego, the metamorphosis of the world in play is also the playful metamorphosis mm -hmm. of the ego. Again, this is wonderful if you're reading a liberative text. Um, well, a text that I would consider, and maybe we would both consider, all of us listening, wondrous, right, and liberative in that sense. Uh, but we would not want to say this thing about other texts, which we would see as, as not liberative on the whole, although other individuals might find 
certain texts liberative for them um, and, 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 and give them imaginative play of the ego so they can understand themselves in ways they never did before. Arguably, this is what Mein Kampf did for a lot of folks who joined the National Socialists. Um, and there's, there's, there's nothing provided here that allows us to say, well, but, but that's, an ideolo that's, the, that's the ideology we're critiquing. Um, I'm, of course, I'm not disagreeing with that. What I'm doing is pointing out that he is unable here to get to the critical moment he wants. Uh, no more able. So he names it. Gadamer realizes he can't do it, so he goes with the classical example and tries to rehabilitate prejudice as, as much as he can with the appeal to that example, which is going to appeal to wisdom traditions, which, by the way, will give him a strong place to stand over and against the National Socialists. But because Nazism violates um, what has been seen as good and um, 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 a way to, to, to organize a politic and behave in every religious tradition. I mean, it would, it would condemn that, right? So, so, so Gottinger's appeal there is, I think, uh, quite strong. Um, and, 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 of course, he, he wants that to be more. He has a sense. I think that's where there is this vague sense. Gottinger doesn't want that to be just a contingency. There is something that is, is a violation of something really real in the Holocaust, uh, not just uh, the, the violation of one dominant tradition um, or one set of traditions, or the classic wisdom traditions over the other, um, but but Gadamer has nowhere to go uh, to, to say that's real. I think that's the the, the vague sense that Ricor senses. But Ricor trying to make the text autonomous, so that becomes the thing that has a matter of the text which instructs us, which we opens up a world. I mean, it, the text does all those sorts of things, but Gadamer, uh, with his uh, um, understanding of the dynamic, the uh, spiraling dynamic of the fusion of horizons, where we each exist with our own horizon, um, and uh, and but in, but are not limited to it imaginatively, um, and then and then combine that with an appeal to the classical example, which tellingly uh, record nowhere mentions in either of these essays we've written uh, read um, about Gadamer. Um, I, I, I guess because he um, found it unconvincing. At the end of this, he talks about the critique of false consciousness can thus become an integral part of hermeneutics. But once again, he's given us no basis for discerning what constitutes false consciousness over and against true consciousness. And, and declaring text autonomous in the way he does doesn't give us a basis for making that discrimination. I think one reason he's very um, popular among many theologians and, and, and biblical studies folks is he works perfectly if you start with the assumption you've got a text uh, which you can trust, which is essentially liberative. Um, and, uh, and again, I don't disagree that that's what uh, the scriptural text is, but how, how are you justifying that? What makes you say that? Where did this text come from? How does it transcend its time? in a history that gives you a critical moment in the sense he wants. He just can't get there. All right. Uh, none, and, he, and then again, let me stand by saying at the end, he seems to acknowledge this uh, because he ends up putting the hermeneutics of tradition in, in opposition to, in a sustained dialectic with, the critique of ideology, which, which seems to me to be somewhat of a signal that he's not convinced by um, his own argument that he's managed to get to critique in the hermeneutics of tradition. Uh, I, I really think his essay would have been strengthened if he had appealed um, to the um, the classical example um, as Gadamer did. Although still it's it's insufficient. It's But it's not the failure of uh, epistemology. Um, it's the failure of the ontology. At least that's what I'll be arguing with you using Levinas uh, later on. Okay, that's it.